Hello, everybody. Pete Caliendo here, Baseball Outside the Box. Hello, everybody. On Facebook Live, you are seeing Steve Foster, Major League Pitching Coach with the Colorado Rockies, former um, pitcher with the Cincinnati Reds, also was a college baseball coach. He scouted with the Rays. He was the assistant to the GM with the Kansas City Royals, um, pitching coordinator. This guy's done everything, so he's well-rounded and all over the game of baseball. We're going to have a great talk here. I want to thank Steve so much for being on the show. Don't forget, before we start, Baseball Outside the Box, please go to it. Spread the word out on social media about the podcast. And So let's welcome our good friend, Steve Foster. How are you doing, buddy? Good, Peter. It's great to be with you, man. I uh, missed opening day yesterday, so let's yeah. talk some baseball. <laughs> I saw uh, all of our social media was opening day pictures from last year, you know, and I'll, uh, and I don't blame them, right? Everybody misses the game, but if we all do what we're supposed to do, follow the rules, everybody, everybody's going to be fine. We'll get back out there to this great game, right? That's right. We just got to stay home right now and give it a little time. Yeah. And listen, I know we've been communicating back and forth social media and, and uh, I really appreciate being on because uh, this is going to be a great talk because I want to get into, you know, if, Major League Baseball, what you guys do with your pitchers, because a lot of it can actually relate to the younger younger coaches, younger players. Um, so right away, without even uh, – my, my first concern is what are your pitchers doing right now? Um, you know, and, and obviously big league pitchers have, you know, a little bit more benefits. They might have a gym in their house or they might be able to go to somewhere where it's only them. But what do you, what's the main focus for them right now so that way they're assured, even though you're going to have spring training, they're assured to be able to start healthy. Peter, it's unprecedented where we're at in baseball right now. We've never been at this point ever in the history uh, um, where, where you've got uh, facilities shut down all over America. You can't uh, meet in groups of people. So it's hard for baseball players. It's hard for pitchers to find places to do what they need to do to prepare for a season. I mean, we were, we were into the process of spring training where uh, starting pitchers were up to three and four innings you know, wow. working towards getting to six innings. Yeah. So now, you know, with everything shut down, it's going to be a redo, a restart, if you will, for spring training. And it's all really about the starting pitching. I mean, if the relievers can get ready quick, the position players can get ready quick. It's the starting pitchers that have to build up. So really the communication with our pitchers right now uh, is kind of networked. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm interacting with all of the major league pitchers and then, of course, we have a, a pitching coordinator and Steve Merriman and Doug Linton and the minor leagues mm -hmm. that are connecting with all of our minor league coaches and minor league pitchers to make sure our guys are staying active. I mean, we we can't uh, run organized groups that are meeting and where they're strength and conditioning and trainers. We can't do that right now. They've shut down everything. So wow. right now it's a matter of guys being able to individually uh, stay in communication with me, make, me making sure that they're doing some activity, staying uh, able to quickly restart this thing when Major League Baseball gives us the thumbs up and lets us go. Absolutely. Steve, there's, you know, in today's game, especially, you know, I, and you know better than anybody, the velocity is going up and up and up. And, you know, yeah. it's a good thing in a lot of ways, but it could also be a bad thing in some ways. Um, what is, do you believe? You know, for your pitchers, especially, you know, should they be focusing on their home and they're working on something because they may have conditioning things they can do? Whatever should they be working on to assure them that later on when they do start throwing that they're going to be strong? Peter, you, you know, in today's baseball world, our pitchers are so much more equipped and so much more knowledgeable. Uh, the last 10 years of the baseball world, especially with pitching, the growth and wisdom that's being shared with facilities across the countries and colleges across the country. Uh, guys have been equipped when they get into pro baseball, they have a feel and understanding. And, and a lot of them have already begun creating the high velocities that we're seeing at sure. younger ages. And some of that's due to the programming that young people are getting through really good teaching at younger ages. It's reverse of the old baseball. Yes. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a lot of pitching was taught from the top to the bottom. In other words, what was taught in the major leagues then trickled down through the minor leagues, down to college, and then, you know, secondary and into, and into facilities across America. But sure. in today's world, a lot of the facilities and a lot of the co college coaches started learning about a lot of the technology and how to use it 
to train pitchers to maximize everything. I mean, it's yes. especially velocity. Pitching Palooza has been, you know, a great tool for a lot of pitching coaches across America. The pitching camp out in Nashville that mm-hmm. that uh, is incredibly informative where all the pitching coaches are meeting and really it's grown to such a great proportion now that all, I mean, front office people and, and of major Absolutely. leagues are going and college yeah. coaches, high school coaches. Just incredible, but the knowledge is being shared, and it's and it's done great. But uh, you know, in answering your question, what these these guys are equipped, they know what to do, they know how to do it, and I don't have to worry about the monitoring so much because each uh-huh. and every individual uh, has gotten enough knowledge and where they're at in their routine and how to maintain that. Now it's just communication and making sure they're doing sure. what they're doing. What about your high school guys? What do you got? Like you got my high school guys. You got travel kids. Um, is there something at home that they, what, you know, that they should be focusing on? Because uh, you just don't want to shut down at all, and all of a sudden, then you know, go out and play. The high school season is not going to be able to have a, a long spring training to get ready. Man, the greatest tool any athlete could use during this period for me. I mean, naturally, I mean, we're all made up of we're physical, mental, emotional, spiritual people. I mean, that's human beings. Yeah. But really, for young people, when there's a time in your life where you're down, when you're out, when you can't do the things that you normally would do, read, read, <laughs> read books, man. There's so many great books out there for young people to help them on the mental side of sports, mm. uh, help them with their with their physical training. I mean, there's great things that are out there, great tools. And to me, that right now. For all young athletes that at this point in time are down and out, we can't do what we normally do. Read. Excellent. Steve, you, when you're working with a major league pitcher, whether it's uh, in a bullpen, um, whether it's in spring training or even during the season, you know, obviously major league pitchers, you know, there's probably less things that you're going to correct. But what are some of the things that you look for in, a, in your pitchers and how do you make some of those adjustments with a big league guy compared to you would with maybe a younger guy? Or maybe it's both the same. Yeah. Well, Peter, I'm in Colorado, and a lot of our pitchers get to the big leagues rather quickly. Uh, we, we don't do a lot of going out and getting older free agent pitchers. You know, uh, Colorado, the, the franchise now has been there for over 25 years, 26 years. And so there's some history. And so the, the, they've learned over time what works and what hasn't worked and we're starting to get a better idea and a lot of it is the younger pitcher that gets to the big leagues with Colorado that's been through our minor league system that's pitched at some of the ballparks that our minor leagues are at in Lancaster and Albuquerque these are these are hitter friendly ballparks and so they get to the course filled and it's not a shock to their system Uh so um, mental training the mental side of the pitcher for us is so invaluable. I mean, it, it, you know, and, and really that goes for all pitchers. I mean, mental toughness is the number one attribute of any pitcher. It doesn't matter how hard you throw. It doesn't matter how good a spin you have. It doesn't matter how good your changeup is. If you don't have a, a sense of mental toughness to you, which is being able to control the controllables when all hell's breaking loose around you. When there's several <laughs> errors around you, when the umpire's yeah. squeezing you, when balls are falling in the gaps at Coors, when balls fly out of the ballpark at Coors because the air stand. I mean, all things can happen in the blink of an eye, and it can happen quick. And that's what I found in Denver. For a pitcher, things happen a lot quicker in Denver. Uh, it can go south really quick, uh, but it's such a game of uh, the pitcher. If he's not a mentally tough guy, he doesn't work in Denver. But that goes to say for really pitchers anywhere, whether they're pitching on a wiffle ball field, sure. or they're at a high school ballpark, or they're uh, in Italy at some ballpark, some remote field. If you're going to pitch, it's a whole different thing, right? And so it's a, it takes a mental awareness and a mental toughness that uh, you, you, you just have to have. Well, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, you think about it. We always look at, well, we got to work with the movements of the pitcher and we forget the mind, how strong it is. And we forget that at the younger levels, they haven't been through some of that. And it's even tougher because how do I deal with that? At the big league level, at least you've had some, you know, uh, some work on it, let's say. 
what are some things that young players, if they do get caught up, you know, in in in, in a situation where they get in trouble, what can, what can they do? Now, obviously, it has to be trained in practice, right? And then that also transfers into the game. Uh, one of the greatest uh, quotes I've heard uh, that I that I've applied in my own life and that I've taught younger people is: "There's no strength without struggle." I mean, uh-huh. the only way your foot gets callousing, right, is walking around barefoot outside. And in overcoming those ouches, I mean, that's just, that's the way it is. You've there's got to be some toughness. So how does a pitcher become tough? He, he, he goes through the adversity of um, people shouting at him from the stands, uh, from umpire squeezing him, from uh, errors being made behind him, from a catcher that's forcing him to throw something he doesn't want to throw all these things come into the makeup of the pitcher and it starts happening from the time they ever step on a mound. The very first time they step on a mound, these things start happening in their lives and they learn how to deal with it over time. By the time a guy becomes a major league baseball pitcher, he's, he's anywhere from 20 to 27, 28 years old. That's, that's about what a guy's going to break into the big league somewhere in there. Right? Well, he's already endured all this in his life to get to that point to be able to emotionally control himself in the heat of the game. But it starts when they're seven and eight and nine years old. So a little league baseball player that puts his hand up when a coach says, do I have any pitchers? Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it starts. <laughs> that's a great way to start. It's, hey, that's how it starts for most kids. They go, yeah, I want to pitch, man. I played catch with my dad or with my buddies out on the street. And I, got, I think I got a pretty good arm. I want to be a pitcher. And then you realize when you get out there, whoa, you know, this is a little bit different than throwing on the side of the house or out in the street. I got people shouting at me. I got throw strikes, you know, and all the other (laughs) things that you hear when you're a kid. Yes. And that never changes. That never stops. Steve, as we as we look at the game more and more, you know, obviously we said that they're throwing faster, uh, more pitchers. Yeah. What are some things for our coaches out there in the U.S. and around the world, especially with the younger levels, what are some things that they can focus on? We, we don't know exactly 100% how to reduce the injuries, obviously, but what are some things that they can do to help reduce some injuries that are occurring at young levels? Well, I think routine, uh, proper training, getting, like I said that all of our – I mean, getting the knowledge that's out there, reading – uh, getting on the internet. I mean, there's so much good information now on the internet that you can find about how to properly train yourself for throwing. I mean, you know, there's all all sorts of different throwing programs, long toss, hard toss at shorter distances. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there's different ways that guys have gone about building up arm strength and maintaining it. In today's world, there's so many good programs out there with cords and bands, with weighted balls with with uh, using the Rapsodo and using the track man. I mean, all these programs that are out there now across really the United States for sure, there's great tools for young people and parents to seek out programs that are using these things uh, and being monitored. I mean, it needs to be monitored when a kid's younger uh, until he learns his routine and gets some maturity and has earned that right to really be able to do things alone. And you certainly know what it's like to go through an injury because you in the big leagues when you were a pitcher went through a career ending injury. Um, what are some of the things maybe you learned from that that you can share with some of our coaches out there? Well, you know, Peter, I had a short major league career. I mean, it just lasted, you know, just under three years. And in my third year, uh, I was with the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, and this was in 1993. We traveled to Los Angeles to uh, play the the Dodgers. And I got a phone call during the morning that asked me to, if I wanted to be on the Jay Leno show. This this is a real deal, Peter. Wow. (laughs) And uh, I thought for sure there were a few older players, maybe a few veterans that were putting me up to a trick. But, you know, at that point in time, (laughs) I was game for it. So I I agreed to do it. Um, You know, the Leno show wheeled in uh, a great big, uh, it was it was, it was a stretch limo with on the side of it, the Jay Leno show. And I hopped in and I brought a teammate of mine, Milt Hill, that went with me. We went to the show and uh, 
we went through a rehearsal and Leno asked me and, you know, he took me, he, I, I sat down with him at his desk, which is pretty cool, by the way. I bet. Uh, and we were just talking in business, small talk. And he goes, okay, this is what we're going to do. All right. We're going to have major league pitcher versus machine. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring out, you know, like if you're throwing at the midway, we're going to set up those bottles and we're going to bring you out and you're going to throw and knock over these bottles. And then we're going to have a pitching machine and we're going to have the pitching machine throw and see if you can knock over the bottles quicker than the pitching machine. Oh, and boy. so he asked me if I, you know, in, in, uh, in the rehearsal, he said, I'm going to grab somebody. This is going to happen in the monologue. And I'm going to grab somebody from the stands, from the audience, and I'm going to ask him if you think a major league pitcher or a, a pitching machine can do this quicker. So uh, we went through the rehearsal, and boom, I knocked the bottles down in one throw, and then we didn't even do the pitching machine. So I go back. I'm back in the room. I'm in the, in the dressing room back there waiting. Um, and they said, hey, I didn't know if you knew this, but uh, Mike Richards is on the show with you. You know who that is, Peter? Uh-uh. That's Kramer. Oh, from wow. Seinfeld. Oh, yeah. Seinfeld. From Seinfeld. Wow. The dude with the tall hair that slides in. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to meet him back there. Same guy as he was on the show. Just crazy. But anyway, I, st I stood back there, talked with him, and then I get ready. I stand behind the curtain, and they show Jay starting the, to do his monologue. Then he walks up into the stands, and he, he pulls out this young lady, and she stands next to him, and he says, you know, we're going to have a major league pitcher knock over balls. You think he could do it faster than the machine? And she goes, uh, I think the major league pitcher. And then he said, bring out Steve Foster, Cincinnati Red. Say, open the curtain, I'll walk out. I got to tell you, I had already at that point in time thrown in many major league stadiums. Sure. But I've never thrown in front of an, a small audience, you know, <laughs> and being, knowing it's, it's being filmed worldwide. It's a little bit different deal. Um, so anyway, I got down through the ball and I knocked over five bottles and then I threw a miss and I knocked it, knocked over the six bottle on the last try. He picks up this young lady at this point in time and brings her down, walks down the stairs, puts her in my arm. He didn't tell me he was going to do this in the rehearsal. Uh, so, uh. I'm like, ah! so I'm standing there with this young lady in my arms and I'm like, what do I do? And I just turn around, walk off the stage with her. And they open the curtain, and me and her just walk off. So um, I share all that story with you because it was a crazy time in, in my life. Um, I was doing well. I was leading the in leading the National League with ERA. I, I was I being used in middle relief late in the game. Um, and so I, uh, uh, Tony Perez was using me in various roles at that time. And I was doing well, which is why I was asked to be on the show. Um that night, I threw two innings against the Dodgers, I believe, at, at, because the film, the show was filmed at 2 in the afternoon, mm -hmm. 2 or 3 in the afternoon. Right. That evening, I pitched against the Dodgers, and the following day, we flew to, or that night, we flew to San Francisco. We were playing the Giants the next night, and I got up again in the bullpen to get loose, and my arm wasn't feeling very well. Oh, my right shoulder, my pitching shoulder, and so... I had to go in, and I, I told Tony, you know, my shoulder's barking. I ain't going to be able to throw tonight. And I believe somebody wrote in an article that I had been hurt on the Leno show. Oh, boy. And I kind of got legs that, you know, one sure. reporter wrote it, and then it got legs that I was hurt on the Leno show. But I actually pitched and I against the Dodgers and was fine, uh, did well. And then the next day, it started bothering me. So whether it, my shoulder had been start, you know, over time, it started deteriorating because I had a lot of things going on. Um, I did end up going on the deal and I never pitched again in the big league. So that was after, like I said, just under three years. But up until that point, I was 27 years old at that point in time. I had never been on a disabled list. I'd never been hurt. I'd never been injured in college. I dislocated my shoulder in high school football. But that never really, uh, I mean, I, I lost my high school football season that year, but I ended up pitching that season and it didn't affect it. Um, how, how to avoid injury. I mean, that, I gave you the history of my injury and how it happened and how it ended my baseball career. But, you know, in today's world, I see um, the, the young pitchers have so much more knowledge and how to take care of their arms. Number one, that the thing that a pitcher starts learning at a young age is that routine is paramount. 
that mm -hmm. routine protects, routine provides, it provides confidence, it provides, you know, a focus, it provides so much for the pitcher prior to a game starting, but it also protects them and provides for them in, in a facility or in high school. If your coach wasn't a pitcher in high school and you're a pitcher, you know, you've got to come in with some sort of a routine on your own and understand the importance of it, uh, especially if your coach was never a pitcher and he doesn't, he, he right. may understand the importance that a routine is important, but he doesn't know all the details of it like you need to know as, mm -hmm. a, as a pitcher, you know, that I get to the field 30 minutes before a game, that I get a towel and a water. I mean, small things, small details. I take a towel and a water down the line. I spend time alone. I focus on my game plan, on, on the way that I attack hitters. I get my stretching routine in without anybody around as I begin to focus. Mm -hmm. And then I start my throwing program, and I do it at the same time every game. And those are things that start should start forming for a pitcher at a young age. And all those things protect and provide for that athlete and help them maintain their arms so that they mm. don't get hurt. I mean, there's, of course, there's strength and training, strength sure. and conditioning programs that are paramount. Uh, if they do a weighted ball program, they need to understand it. They need to work with someone that's used it uh, or a cord program. There's so many great things that Alan Yeager and Joe Newton, I mean, there's so many great programs mm. that are out there now that these kids can tap into at a young age and, sure. and start developing their arm uh, care. I, absolutely. Hey, you, you know, we're talking about routine. This would be interesting because a lot of times, you know, each pitcher is an individual person. I get that. And they all have their different routines. But prior to a game, a general routine, you know, when the pitcher goes out to the outfield and then also from there he goes to the bullpen, even even kind of what to do in the bullpen before a game, you know, how many pitches, what kind of pitches. Yeah. And again, I know it's a general question, but kind yeah. of give our coaches a, an idea what kind of routine that pitcher should have? Yeah, like you said, it's individual, but, you know, you could ballpark it. Once a kid gets to the mound and he starts warming up, getting preparing for the game, um, I'll give you an example. Kyle Freeland, for us, a starting pitcher, can be ready from the time he steps on the mound to the time he goes into the game, anywhere from 24 to 28 pitches. Uh, and that's not many, right? I mean, yeah. you, you would consider many people think, wow, that's not very many pitches. And right. then we have a guy like Herman Marquez or Antonio Senzatella who will go anywhere from 35 to 45 pitches, you know, based on how he's feeling, based on the weather and, and, and if he's getting loose quickly. Uh, but all the guys have their set routine down on paper. They write it. They provide it for us so that we know exactly what this routine is going to be. Because if you write something, you tend to remember it more. If you write it, most of them already have it in their memories. They already know it because they've been doing it, but they've tweaked it over time. They made small changes over time. But the routine that Kyle Freeland came in with to the big leagues, he's had through the minor leagues in college. Yeah. So these are, these are things that young people start developing and need to develop and are taught by many of their college coaches and even some high school coaches or, or the facilities are, are helping young people learn. So when yeah. a kid gets to the mound, he needs to get his fastball going to both sides of the plate, start working in his secondary pitches, and then start doing some sequences. You know, if, if he throws a, a, a fastball curveball change up, he may start with two or three fastballs on the extension side of the plate, two or three fastballs on, on the inside of the plate, and then start doing some sequences out of the windup. Then he goes to the stretch and he does basically the same routine out of the stretch that he did out of the windup. And then many pitchers like to finish by facing the hitter with the catcher calling pitches. Yes. So, uh, you know, anywhere from 20, and, and again, that it's individual. So it could be 25 and it might be 45, but so, you know, the, the, the safe zone for me is somewhere between 30 to 35 that's in between those. Right. So that that's where majority of pitchers are, are ready for, a starting a game to start steve so you know you look back when you pitch in the big leagues or even when i was at making on baseball school i'm thinking boy the game has changed in a lot of ways now the game's the game but how we train how we do things you know a great example is what you just said and i know for 10 years i've been i, I had, i've always had a when a pitcher was warming up i've always had a batter there right because we're trying right. to prepare them for the game especially mm -hmm. for young 
young players. You want to try to simulate the actual game so they can be ready for it. What are some of the things that you changed in your coaching throughout the years that are different now than they were possibly before that can help our coaches? Because that way we don't, you know, we're not always doing the same thing. We're, we're changing some of our routines. A great saying is preparation prevents panic, right? Ah. So the more prepared a young athlete is, the more prepared a coach is, the less likely when the heat goes up in the kitchen, when the flame goes up, yeah. that's, <laughs> when you, that's, that's, that's what the real test is. Because on si if you can throw perfect sides and, and sit and paint corners and drop your curveball in there, uh, it's all fine and great. And it looks great for a scout if you can do it on the side without a hitter in there. But the real measure is when the heat goes up, when the tests come in the game, can you do it then? So how can coaches help simulate the heat going up? Yeah. Right? So there's different ways. I mean, I've seen, I've utilized, um, you know, competitive sides where two guys are throwing sides at the same time mm. and you're going pitch for pitch. Who can win? Because you got to find ways to help athletes compete because that's sure. what they love doing. And it's hard for pitchers to be able to find the heat going up in the kitchen, if you will, uh, to try to, to uh, simulate what it's like in a game. And just throwing sides without hitters in there doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, monotony and without lacks creativity. And many young people in today's world need – creativity in what they're doing or you just lose them. They go off on another planet. It may look like they're accomplishing something, but it, but they're not. It's just monotony over and over and over. And then when the heat goes up in the kitchen, we can't, we can't do what's, what, we're, what we need to be doing to help our team win. And that is maintaining emotional control, maintaining control of the strike zone, uh, controlling the count, controlling the running game, Controlling the four facets, plus and minus pitching, in and out. So all these things a pitcher has to be able to control. So a coach, uh, we have to be creative as often as we can in finding ways for our pitchers to compete. Because mm. that is the only way that we can take them to a level of where it's like game-like. And whether we're using dummies, whether we're taking them out of their comfort zone and their sides, scripting them in ways that they would not be comfortable but I don't throw that pitch. Throw it, you know, calling out exactly what we want to see. Uh, a one, two curveball in the dirt ball. Great. Was it on the plate where you're trying to throw it? Yes. Next pitch. If it's not, we repeat it. If it's, if he doesn't get it the second time, we repeat. So, so verbally giving, giving scripting pitches to take pitchers to a place where they're uncomfortable. Remember, that's what's going to happen in the game. They're going to get to places where they're uncomfortable. And then they have to be able to perform. And the great ones are able to perform when all hell's breaking loose around them. When the <laughs> errors come, when the ump's squeezing them. When, like I've said before, when, when everything's going wrong that could go wrong, the, the, the elite pitchers look just like you and me sitting here talking, Peter. Yes. It's just calm. And, and, you know, yesterday I watched some of the opening days from the past because there was no opening day, baseball being, being suspended. And I yeah. got to watch some great pitchers pitch, and I was, all of them that I was watching, these are number ones, they're starting opening day. But all of them had a calmness to them. You know, with, with Woody Williams pitching at Coors Field, watching that game. I mean, he, balls were flying all over in the gaps and dropping and, Hey, he had an umpire squeezing him, and it looked like he was on a bike ride. Just give me the ball, boom, give me the ball. Emotional control is so key for the pitcher, and they need to start developing at a young age. Awesome. You know, maybe I ought to take everybody to the Dominican Republic and just let them play there for a while and talk about uncomfortable and then bring them back into the States. We'd be a lot better, I think. <laughs> Peter, um, I know you travel all over the world, so you, you, you see a lot you know, of different environments and how that provides uncomfortability. Yeah. Right? And then they come here and it's sometimes a little too easy for them because they've been through all the, you know, the, the rough gloves, the, the rough fields, the different baseballs. Everybody says, well, the baseball is not the same weight. Well, when you're in a Dominican, you're playing one game, you'd be playing with 10 different balls, different sizes, different weights, you know, so you're in an uncomfortable situation. The mound may not be very good, right? You got to make an adjustment. 
our guys sometimes don't know how to make that adjustment. They want the mound fixed. Well, but you don't always have people that can fix your mound for you like you do in the big leagues, you know? So I think it's great, but um, I think you brought up some great points there. Uh, what? How's that, how's spring training changed then from when you were in spring training to spring training now? There's some things that are different that you guys do in spring training to prepare players? Oh, man. Peter. Big time. And yeah, big time. I mean, you're, you're talking, you know, 20, 30 years there. Um, really over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, professional baseball, major league baseball, uh, the, the, uh, the amount of people involved and the routines involved individually, um, you know, for each and every pitcher, there's an individual workout that's for him. And so in the past, it was, uh, everybody get out there and everybody do your throwing program. Uh -huh. This is, this is how the throwing program looks. And this is what we're going to do. In today's world, if you go and you stay, if you come down and you watch all of our pitchers throw, you're going to see 10 different throwing programs. Wow. Because that's each guy is different and likes different styles. Some wow. guys like to back up and throw to 300 feet. Some guys like to throw at 150 feet. We don't say to one guy, hey, you need to do it this way when he believes, he believes that it helps him. Uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, spirit, the whole thing, that if I back up and I get a good long toss program in, it helps me build strength. It helps me loosen my arm. It helps me free my mind. When another guy goes, I don't want to back up. I don't, I don't need all that throwing. I want to keep it short, and I'm going to spend more time in the weight room. So you have different, different uh, uh, viewpoints from different pitchers, and we were to help benefit them and make them the very best they can be working with them and what they want and what they like along with what we believe. So we have strength and condition. Now in today's baseball world, there's strength and conditioning at every single level. So there's mm -hmm. strength and conditioning teachers at, at our instructors at, at the major league, triple A, double A, able all the way down. And they're doing the same thing for all the athletes, teaching and training individually. And then within that, some things that are very important to us, right? Uh, with As the Colorado Rockies, every organization has, you know, maybe a four or five absolutes, things that they feel like are important to their athlete, to their pitchers. And those are the things they teach and train, you know, so that's what we do. You know, Steve, this also, you know, the more you talk about, you know, the, the competition aspect, the pressure aspect, the different type of training for individuals. You know, we're also talking, this is a lot more fun. You know, big league players are no different than younger, young kids. Yes, they're older, but they love that fun. You know, I have a good friend of mine who trained the Hawks, the Chicago Blackhawks during the strike. Um, and he does all kinds of fun, different things with the big league guys. And they love that type of practice because it's a variety. So we should really be focusing on and at the younger levels to make sure we're doing the same thing, making it fun and changing things for the players. There's nothing like uh, changing the dynamic daily for the mind, for the young mind. And some of the greatest teachers I've had in my life, there was a, there was a level of unpredictability. Uh -huh. There was something about what was going to happen tomorrow. What was it going to be like? To, what's it going to be like tomorrow? All right. We did this today. What's it going to be like tomorrow? You know, the coach I played for in high school, Benny Jones, one of the winningest high school coaches in the state of Texas. Uh, we went to three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back state championship games when I was there in high school. And one of the reasons is because I had a, a coach that kept it fresh. He kept it fresh every day. The unpredictability factor. And to me, um, Back in the early 2000s, up here where I live in Wisconsin, it's freezing cold in January, February. <laughs> you don't go outside. You're crazy. Well, if you do, you're on skis and you're cross-country skiing or you're snowmobiling. So what I did was I started a league called uh, a wiffle ball league. Ah, and I, I think it was the YMCA up here. And we did an indoor wiffle ball league, and it was anywhere from 7- to 11-year-old kids, boys and girls, love competing. It. And it formed and it grew to epic proportion. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why the whole idea worked and was incredible. Because number one, it was indoor in a cold state. Number two, we changed the field every week. 
So one week we named it Yankee Stadium and we set the, di- the, the parameters of the field to Yankee Stadium. The next week we set it to Fenway Park and then Coors Field. But we changed the field every Saturday. So the kids and parents and uncles and aunts and friends, everybody that came, didn't know what field they were coming to. So they walked in, whoa! So we had to spend a lot of time uh, coming up with creat- creative ideas to change the field and the dimensions. And we, we had ways to do that, and it was a lot of fun. But it can be done, and it can be done cost efficiently, and it works in cold weather environments. But the key was uh, something that I learned back then, and that is people love unpredictability. Yes. When they're, and, and, they're, and if you can take what's important, what's important to wiffle ball, that kids are having fun, that they're competing, that it's kept serious but fun. And so at the major league level – you know, it's competing. It's it's at the highest level. You have to have focus. You have to have control of a lot of things. But if it isn't fun and unpredictable, some you lose them. Love it, love it, love it, Steve. We got a couple more things. I know you got. Even though you're inside, you still have a busy <laughs> schedule. Um, it seems like I don't know about you, but it seems like my day goes a lot faster. I got a lot more to do now that I'm home. <laughs> more than when I'm traveling. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's wild. Um, take us inside the preparation before a ball game. Now, I know you guys have a series, so obviously you all get together before the series. And you got in, in the big leagues, you have a lot of technology, a lot of uh, statistics and all that. But, and take us a little bit inside how you're preparing the pitchers for that series um, with your catchers, the communications, a little bit about the signs, not what signs you give, but you know, how that all that kind of gets organized. Well, it's it's so many people that are involved, Peter, now. I mean, uh, you know, we have uh, video tech. We have uh, analytics. Mm-hmm. We have um, so many variables now that are a part of preparation for uh, one game. Uh, and And really... The, the pitching coach for the pitcher is the organizer and manager of all this information so that not only are they physically being trained and, and prepared and mental and me, the mental part of it is the preparation that all these modalities, all these different things that come together. So if analytics provides me with uh, heat maps and, uh, you know, exit velocities and, and all the different things that they do. And then the defensive positioning and all the shifting in today's game. So we, we have to prepare as pitchers and catchers to pitch the way that best helps us be successful. So we spend a lot of time. I, I, I ask all of our starting pitchers to prepare on their own. And then when we come to a pregame meeting, they are prepared as I have and as the catcher has. So that it's not me yeah. telling them what to do. So they're telling you, this is how we're going to pick right. the shit guys. That's right. And then you might, now, is there times where sometimes you might throw something in there that maybe they yeah. miss? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because remember, I've got all this information coming from different people. And yeah. I've prepared through looking at video. But he's done the same thing. And he knows what his pitches are. He knows how he's, a lot of them are, have history on, with guys in the past and what they sure. do. They have an idea of what they want to do, as the catcher does as well. So it's it's three men, and sometimes the bullpen uh, coach will join me as well in, in his preparation. So you've got three or four people, maybe another catcher, five people in a room for 30 minutes to an hour pregame discussing the game plan for that day. Now, you know, across 30 organizations, people do it differently. Uh, there may be 30 different ways that people do it. This sure. is a way that I've really liked uh, in my in going into my sixth year as the pitching coach for the Rockies, and it's changed a little bit over time. But one thing that's held the constant is that the pitcher comes in with the plan. Yes, and that's that's important for me that they've put the time in and not just doing what they're being told to do. Sure, Steve. We also know plans always don't work the way they're supposed to all the time. So what happens when? I've got so and so coming up. We know we're going to do this pitch. You know how we're going to pitch to him. Unfortunately, the pitcher doesn't throw the ball where they're supposed to. Now you're behind in the count. Who's making the call 
of what the pitch is going to be if they're going to make adjustments. Is the catcher making that call according to all the game plan, or is the pitching coach or somebody else? Well, the pitcher's making the call. The pitcher's making the decision. The catcher's giving a strong suggestion. And ah. the preparation pre – this is the way that I handle it with our pitchers and catchers. I prepare them, I hold them accountable, and I let them do what they're good at. I empower them. So a, a, a professional athlete that feels empowered is a, is a tough weapon. I mean, to me, if, if I feel like I'm boxed in and I can only do it a certain way, I, 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 I feel held back like a horse with a rein on it. To me, I want wild Mustangs with, with uh, you know, some control. Yeah. So to me, it's making those tough decisions. Great pitchers are world champion decision makers. I That's love the it. greatest way that I know how to describe a major league pitcher. Because while in their 12 to 18 seconds after they throw a pitch and they get the ball, the things in their mind is what did that pitch just do? What did it accomplish? What's the count? What's the score? Where are we at in the game? All these things in the blink of an eye have to be running through a pitcher's mind. But again, wow. it's over time from the time they're seven, eight, nine. 12 years old, 14 years old, the more experience they have in life, they know how to deal with these quick decisions over time and making world champion decisions. Because if I throw a pitch there and this is the result and this is the swing I got, then if I throw this pitch here and I execute it, if I execute the pitch, then I already know in my mind, I'm already thinking, okay, if I execute this pitch, then the next pitch, this is what I would like to do without losing focus of the here and now. Never living in the future, never living in the past, the home run I gave up, or what's going to happen the next inning, focused on this moment, while at the same time going, if I execute this pitch, I already know what I'm going to do on the next pitch. World champion decision making. Outstanding. And now, what's your advice to younger coaches with younger players when it comes to calling pitches yeah how should it start and you know where does it go now again we know that yeah. everybody's different but yeah. where do we start do we let the yes. catcher do it pitcher you know i mean he might only be 12 13 14 years old yeah man that's a great question and the way that i would do it peter if i was a coach of a 13 14 15 year old get him ready maybe they're in travel ball i'm let's say i'm a travel ball coach and i got four pitchers and i got two catchers maybe three I sit down with each guy, with the, with the catchers, and if I have two catchers, I sit down with two catchers and this pitcher. And I say, all right, let's go. Let's get a piece of paper and pen out. Let's write, let's write down right now, what's your best commanded pitch? Number one, some guys, most guys fastball, right? Most guys. Next mm -hmm. pitch, right, this guy's a curveball, the other guy's a slider, the other guy's a changeup, all right? And then with another guy, his best commanded pitch may be the slider. So that's his number one pitch. All right, so we say in even counts, 0-0, oh, 1-1, oh, 2-2, one, one, two, two. these are action counts. If I was teaching young pitchers today, I would say take your number one and your number two best commanded pitches. If a pitcher at that age doesn't know what that is, you may have to help them. You mm -hmm. command your fastball. And your curveball, those are your two best commanded pitches. Or you command your changeup and your fastball. And you write down that number one and number two best commanded pitch. And then you look at even counts. Oh, oh, one, one, two, two. Why? Because those are your action counts. We need strikes in those counts. That is, un I'm not going to argue that with you, pitcher or catcher. So, catcher, if you're calling his third or fourth pitch in an action count, you're wrong. You're wrong. You need you need an action count, 001122, to be using the best commanded pitches the pitcher has, forcing contact, forcing action. We want a 01 count. We do not want a 10 count. When we get to 1 1, right? We want a 1 2 count, not a 2 1 count. And for sure, when we get to 2 2, we are avoiding the 3 2. I'm forcing action. I'm using a pitch that the pitcher can command, not trying to get chase, not trying to get chase off the plate. Of course, those are generalizations, Peter. But sure, they're but it's great a, for young pitchers. Absolutely. They're great for young coaches. 
to teach and train the young pitcher how to be successful. If, if you had advice for most coaches and they're working with pitchers, uh, young pitchers, fastball, obviously they got to know what would be the next pitch you start with after a fastball change up, working up change up and oh, then oh, work from sure. there. Yeah. Work because, from there. Yeah. And, and yeah. what's the main reason? Um, because it gives a variation in speed. Uh, you know, for me, mo the most important thing, hitting is timing. So all, all we're doing is working on messing with the timing. Yes. If I can develop a fastball and a changeup at a your early age, and all pitchers can do it. Now, a lot of pitchers will say, I don't need a changeup. My slider's filthy, and I got a great fastball. Well, that's great. That's great. But if your fastball is 88 and your changeup is 82, and you have not, or, or your slider is 82, all right, the variation isn't enough. So the good hitters on the team you're facing, if there's not more variation in your pitches, in other words, go from 88 to 70. The more variation I have in those pitches, the more I mess with timing. Hitting is timing. Yes. So if I, I, need, I need more variation in pitches. So if I have for, for our pitchers, if I have Herman Marquez that throws at 95, sits at 95, 94, 95, good days, 97, 98. He needs, you know, if his, if his uh, curveball is 78 and his slider is 88, his changeup is somewhere between 85 to 90. He's got four pitches with variation. So it's hard as a hitter that has to time up your pitches and also look for four different pitches to hit. That's why he's successful a lot. Love but it. for young pitchers, if you only have two pitches and you're developing one, to me it's fastball, change up, then the third secondary pitch. That being said, some kids are born with a knack to spin the baseball. I was just going to ask that. <laughs> hey, man, and you don't take that from them. And to me, you know, the, the greatest disservice a young coach could do for a 12-year-old kid that already knows how to spin a baseball. Why? God gifted. God gifted. I don't know how to uh, other explain it. Some kids can sit and throw a curveball when they're 12 years old properly. Now, they may not have all the pieces that you need to help them with as a coach or get them help with, but they already know how to spin a baseball. And you know it because you catch it and you see it. Sure. And if a kid can spin the ball at a young age, to me, it that you know, if you go across the major leagues, Peter, and you did you did a uh, question and answer with every pitcher, and you asked them, when did you start spinning a baseball? Majority of them would tell you twelve to fourteen years old. Yes, Majority and you of said them. you or said younger. the key, and you said the key word properly. Real quick, mm -hmm. what is that properly? What kind of spin? Properly for a curveball, twelve to six. That's keeping the fingers on top of the ball, Perfect. right? Yeah. And to me, you know. Being able, you have to pull the ball out different on a curveball. You you have to, you know, your arms a little shorter when you finish it out front. You know, to me, there's things that that can be taught using the curveball. And again, for kids and coaches out there, there's so many tools out there on the internet. You there can is. type in curveball into YouTube and get yep. 50 coaches showing you how to properly throw a curveball. <laughs> So it's and, out there for you. And great example how times have changed. We've got so much information in our hands nowadays. All right, Steve, this has been great. Last thing, um, and then at the end, uh, any advice that you want to give coaches, players, and parents on pitching? Any last-minute advice? Uh, you know, Just open it up. Just let them know. But one thing I want to take the audience into is – you know, what I got out of a lot of this is the mental part of the game uh, that yep. you really work on, okay? And that's 100%. When – Taking a pitcher out of a game, deciding when you're going to take them out, is not an easy thing for coaches to do. I remember when I, when I was doing it, you know, determining that. And I know it's going to change with situations, but a general idea of what goes in through your mind when you're going to take a pitcher out, and also when you go out to talk to them, uh, to a pitcher, what kind of conversation you might have with certain pitchers, because nobody gets to hear that, what, what you do in the big leagues when you go out to the mound. What are you telling that guy once in a while? <laughs> That's a question you get asked a lot when you're a pitching coach. What do you say when you go out there? Right? Sure. Be, oh, well, from true. a coaching standpoint, it also help because yeah. we could be saying some things incorrectly that we're not aware we're saying. Yeah. You know, um, the managers at the big league level, you know, I work with Buddy Black, who's a former big league pitcher. So pitcher, he, yep. and I talk, he and I talk, 
you know, in the middle innings of what we're seeing. You know, if we see a guy tiring, if he's missing his spots, if he's getting deep in counts, does he have a lot mm. of competitive at-bats, deep counts, where a lot of foul offs, a lot of foul offs, um, walks. I mean, all these things play into, you know, where we, what the decisions we make in the middle of a game. Uh, in today's baseball world, Peter, another thing that's changed, right? Uh -huh. Back to 30 years ago, guys would throw 130 to 150 pitches. Yep. Uh, all of the information that came out from doctors over the last 30 years and protecting the arm and the investments uh, professional teams make on pitchers and the protection of those investment. I mean, a lot of things have changed in protecting the pitcher's arms from a standpoint of pitch count. You know, back when I pitched uh, and other guys that are my age in their 50s, uh, nobody ever even asked us how many pitches we ever threw. Right. Now a pitcher will come out after their second inning and say, how many pitches am I at, right? Now, not in the big leagues because they can look up on the board. It's all on the board. Right, but, but the in, younger. In high school and college, they, they're Absolutely. already caught and trained. They yes. already know what, what their pitch count is. So that's different. That's changed. That's a, it's, it's, it's a dynamic game. It's always changing. But for us as coaches, we're looking – at everything I just said, the deep counts, walks, uh, missed pitches, you know, are they starting to put the barrel to the ball more? Just mm -hmm. reading all of that. Uh, trips to the mound are at different times, man. Sometimes it'll be for encouragement. Sometimes yeah. it'll be just to engage them, just to slow the game down. So, you know, another time it may be to equip them with the knowledge of who they're facing and who's coming up and what he hits and where his his the best zone to go with if if we're struggling with certain pitches what what pitches to use so it's more to me every time I go out to the mound my first step on the dirt to go onto the field is the word encouragement comes to my mind because wow. I'm not going out there unless it's not a time that a pitcher needs encouragement and you ask me for advice to me the the, the greatest piece of advice that I could give uh, to anyone working with pitchers is that um, it's a really hard thing to do at 60 feet, six inches to throw a five ounce sphere mm -hmm. right, with 108 seams on it yeah. over 17 inches. Yeah. Right? It's hard to do. They I've heard, you know, the argument hitting's the hardest thing to do in the, in any sport. Right. Uh, my only argument to that is, the people that say that probably never pitched. <laughs> You're right about that. And so a pitcher needs encouragement, man. And uh, how do we encourage them? You know, it, it doesn't mean we pacify poor performance because we don't. But what we do is, and to me at Coors Field, uh, the mental toughness, the relentless mentality that it takes, being able to execute pitches in the heat of the moment and make role class decisions, you know, uh, respecting 90 feet at all times, whether I'm holding a runner or making a field. I mean, if you don't feel the, if you can't field your position at Coors Field and hold runners at Coors Field, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. <laughs> so I need encouragement if I'm a pitcher. If I mess up, and they do, because all pitchers do, I hang a pitch, I bobble the ball and don't get the out, I throw to the wrong base sometimes. I mean, um, they have to be adaptable. They have to be teachable. They have to be moldable. But it all starts with encouragement. Two positives to every negative? No, heck. Eight positives <laughs> to every negative. If I need the pitcher to hear something negative that I have to say, it's got to be done in the sandwich, right? There's got to be positives on both ends of it. And that's paramount for someone who pitches at a, a tough place to pitch. Steve, outstanding. Sure. Let me tell you, this has been a great, great show. <laughs> You could just see your passion, enthusiasm, obviously your knowledge. Uh, I'm in, I'm thrilled because I got a chance to catch up with you. I hope to see you soon. Got to thank you so much for being on the show, man. This is awesome. It's my pleasure, Peter. Good to connect with you again, brother. All right, folks. That is Steve Foster, Major League Pitching Coach with the Colorado Rockies. I'm Pete Caliendo, host of the Baseball Outside the Box. want to thank Steve. want to thank our producer, Brian Kroc, also our host, the Lineup Media Group. Folks. Special thanks to everybody in the U.S. and around the world. 
for listening. You are what makes our show. Please spread the show around the world as best you can. We want to keep getting more and more of a bit larger audience. We're getting higher and higher when it comes to attendance. And we want to thank you, our loyal listeners. All right, everybody. This is Pete Caliendo from Chicago in our studio. We will say goodbye for today. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you.